Hello friends. So today we are going to do the essay Oxford in the Vacation by Charles Lamb. And in, in uh, one of my previous videos I have discussed or uh, spoken about the chief features of uh, Charles Lamb's prose style. And uh, now this essay is a very delightful one as are all his essays. And uh, you see a lot of um, humor. It's so sometimes outright hilarious. You would feel like laughing out aloud. And when you read or before you read uh, his essays, uh, you can also take listen to the earlier video so that you will know what to look for when you're reading Charles Lamb's essays. Uh, so this particular one titled Oxford in the Vacation again is a highly personal, a highly nostalgic and a highly autobiographical essay. He narrates his experiences of being at Oxford. Now he was not a student at Oxford because he had to stop his official schooling at the age of 15 and he had to work. He continued to work after that till his retirement. So he couldn't enjoy the privilege of being a student at Oxford or Cambridge. But he says he used to go there during the vacations. When there are holidays, he used to go to the campus and just walk about here and there in the campus. And in that way, somehow or the other, try to make up for what he had lost. So that is what he talks about in this essay. This is not going to be a line by line explanation because that's going to take ages to complete. It's a pretty long essay. A quick a summary of maybe paragraph by paragraph. I just tell you what is there in each paragraph and you can do the reading on your own. So he says that any reader who takes up this essay to read, you would definitely look at the bottom of the essay to see who has written it. And then you will find the name Elia. And you would, he says, I can almost read her, I can hear you exclaim, who is Elia? So you would wonder who this man is. And then he says, uh, in the previous essay about the South Sea House, he had mentioned that he was a clerk at an office. And I'm sure that you would think that I am some kind of a clerk. And he says, yes, it is true. I recognize the fact that I am a clerk. I confess that it is my... A humor my fancy in the tour part of the day when the mind of your man of letters requires some relaxation okay let me not read the whole thing so he says he works as a clerk and he's a writer too but in the daytime he plays a kind of a double role in the daytime he's a clerk working at um, the office of the East India Company as I mentioned in the earlier it was called the East India House and there he was uh, kind of an accountant and so in the daytime he says that I am amidst a lot of things like indigo and cotton and raw silks and such things uh, which um, come from India and at other times that is in the evening he says he is a writer and he talks about the benefits of uh, how being a clerk helps being a writer because he says one thing the gain is material because he gets a lot of waste paper and outside sheets on which he can write his poems or essays or whatever so that's a very uh, a kind of a material benefit that he gains so all the paper that goes waste in the office he can bring it home and he can write on it so otherwise even intellectually he says it is quite good for him. He uses an interesting term. He says, uh, the very pairings of a counting house are in some sort the settings up of an order. Pairing, like when you take a vegetable or a fruit, you cut away the inedible parts, the outer coating of the fruit, the stem and sometimes the seeds. So those are called the pairings, the waste parts of a fruit or a vegetable. So he says, similarly, the pairings of that work that is the waste paper, the wrappers, the foolscap paper, all that goes waste there, it helps me as an author. He also says that the enfranchised quill, quill he refers to his pen. So the pen which all day long plods or uh, writing down figures and ciphers and writing down the accounts of how much silk had arrived that day, how much cotton was imported or exported or whatever. So now this same pen he uses it in the evening. 
and in the evening the pen is very happy because it flows with ease over the flowery carpet ground of a midnight dissertation dissertation here he only means an essay he called some of his essays dissertations so the pen is also very happy because it's fed up of writing bills and uh, accounts and zeros and numbers during the day and it is very happy and it flows easily on the flowery carpet ground of the essay and the pen he says it feels its promotion so the pen feels that it is promoted because the other time it's just an ordinary pen working in an office but in the evening it achieves a literary dignity so you can see how beautifully he puts that and how happily he takes both his roles both as the clerk and as the writer he doesn't complain at all that he had to go to work he couldn't study and any you don't find any ill feelings there and then uh, in the next paragraph he says not that in my anxious detail okay so what he's trying to say that he, he says that i'm not saying that my job is the best job in the world and the job of the clerk is very interesting no uh, there are negatives too and i too love to get a break from this work this tedious monotonous work at the office and so he says i too enjoy uh, getting holidays and uh, see this is how he arrives to the topic of holidays and then uh, holidays are great consolation for him he calls them consolatory interstices that is welcome breaks that console him that give his mind a kind of a rest from all these figures and numbers and so uh, he says that earlier they were red letter days and now they are dead letter days okay so what he means is that uh, there were many holidays earlier and uh, uh, when england later on in england many holiday in the protestant england uh, many of the earlier catholic holidays uh, declared as working days so that's why he says many red letter days became dead letter days and uh, the days of paul and stephen and barnabas and all this which used to be holidays when he was a little boy now they are working days and he laments the laws of holidays because we all know whether you are st whether you students or whether you teachers or anybody working anywhere a holiday is welcome to all of us even if it's for one day you know how happy you are when you know that you're going to be on or get a leave so the same thing here too and then uh, he mentions a long list paul stephen barnabas andrew john so these were all men in old times but now unfortunately Uh, the holidays in their honor have been cancelled and then he tells us that how when he was in school because it is in school that you are most fond of holidays and uh, when he was school at christs uh, i remember the effigies by the same token in the old basket prayer book now in school especially in england and in a christian school you know that the prayers are compulsorily imposed upon students whether they are interested or not and so he says i remember each of these saints very vividly in my mind because in the prayer book there is a picture of each of the saint and so he he still remembers the pictures and uh, there hung peter in his uneasy posture holy bartlemy in the troublesome art of flaying after the famous marcias by spagnoletti okay so here the reference is to saint bartolomeo and said bartolomeo is uh, believed to be one of the 12 disciples in the new testament and uh, according to the new testament he is considered one of the 12 and he was for spreading the word of god he was flayed alive you know what flaying is uh, it is a disgusting and a very cruel form of punishment where a person's skin is removed the skin is peeled off keeping the man alive okay and in the process of course they would most probably die uh, immediately or uh, after some time but it was a very kind of a cruel punishment and that is what happened to saint bartholomew and uh, those who again uh, want to know what it looks like this you just have to type bartholomew in google and just look at some of the images and you can see what milton is talking about, i mean um, charles lamb is talking about and so he says so all those images bartholomew being flayed and P saint peter and he remembers all of them and uh, he says i have regretted i have wept the defalcation of iscariot so uh, you know that there are 12 uh, disciples of christ and 
there is one day to celebrate each of them and each of these days were holidays earlier and he used to feel so sad that uh, judas of iscariot and that is the one who betrayed um, jesus christ so here defalcation is doing something wrong so what was the wrong that uh, judas did he betrayed jesus christ so charles lamb tells us very uh, openly and very genuinely that when he was a little boy he regretted this fact because if judas had not done this um, defalcation we would have got one more holiday so i guess you easily understand this uh, love for holidays and uh, let me just re- tell you another thing too and he says another unfortunate thing that uh, the feast of two you know the feast this the special days on which the saints are honored they are called feast days so he says the feasts of jude better jude jude and simon it was clubbed together and one day was given to both of them and he says that again was something that i was so unhappy about why could they not have two separate days so why did they have to club one because you get only one holiday i guess we understand this very easily because you know what all of us i know in any part of india however nationalistic we may be in our feelings i know how unhappy we would feel if um, independence day chance to be on a sunday or october 2nd again if it was uh, instead of coming on a weekday if it comes on a sunday or a saturday which is already holiday you know how disappointed you are it's true that you admire your great leaders and you love your nation and all that but yet when especially when your children a holiday is definitely a holiday and nothing can compensate for that so that is exactly what uh, charles lamb is uh, telling us here as i told you in the previous video about his characteristics i and I, i told you that you cannot but help loving this man he so guile guileless in what in his expression of his feelings and how openly he tells us about so many things and uh, the interesting thing is that we too can uh, relate very well to what he is saying and then uh, he says uh, again he continues one more paragraph on these holidays um, these were bright visitations in a scholars and a clerk's life far off their coming shone so he quotes from somewhere and he says holidays are bright visitations they are happy occurrences in the life of both a scholar a student and a clerk because both want uh, to escape from uh, the work that they have to do otherwise and far off their coming shone so far away when you know that a holiday is coming maybe next week right from now onwards you start feeling very expectant and you start relaxing because you know that there is a holiday coming next week and that is what he's telling us here and uh, he says uh, those days i was as good as an almanac almanac is is a calendar where all these um, important days are recorded now in all these calendars that we have which we use at home you have all these uh, descriptions isn't it the uh, the time of the sunset the sunrise and um, in the hindu you have this um, dwadashi ekadashi all those days are so that kind of a calendar where all these details are included it's called an almanac and so he says that um, i was a walking almanac because you ask me any holiday even coming two weeks later i would know exactly and now i guess in this um, context we have to remember the school in which he studied christ's college and uh, again uh, i'm sorry to keep saying that in the previous video i have mentioned but i have mentioned there about how the schooling experience for him was uh, a little difficult in the sense the teachers there were quite cruel because it was kind of a charity school and it was it, the, the, all the students were poor children who were sponsored by somebody else or who didn't have the parents couldn't afford to send them to school so this was a school where such children were put and so the teachers sometimes were very uh, uh, cruel to them uh, very violent uh, in their expression of anger and so maybe studying in this kind of a school you would all the more be welcoming towards holidays and so he says those days i used to wait or i used to know all the holidays by heart and um, he says sometimes there was uh, this festival of epiphany epiphany is celebrated uh, on january 6th that is supposed to be the day when the three wise men uh, visited the baby jesus christ and realized that he is the incarnation of god so that day is epiphany and he says sometimes what happens is this day of epiphany which is supposed to be a very happy day uh, a day of celebration that would fall exactly on a sabbath day a sabbath day is 
Sunday. It's Sunday for uh, Christians, for Jews. Sabbath begins on Friday evening and goes up on up to Saturday evening. So when when uh, Epiphany, the day of Epiphany falls on a Sabbath day, that again is a tragedy because uh, on Sabbath you are expected to sit at home or and pray. Hmm? Pray. It is a day um, which you just uh, uh, kind of gift for a god and worshiping god and so on that day you cannot celebrate so again it was very sad when epiphany and a sabbath would come on the same day and uh, he says so uh, you would think that i am being profane profane means talking against uh, um, religion talking against god but then um, he says i am not actually being profane it's something very genuine that i'm expressing and again i know that i don't have to uh, talk about such things that's why he says i am wading out of my depths because it is not in my control to declare holidays or to decide that a holiday is no more a holiday so that's why uh, i'm just saying what i felt like saying i know that i am not an authority to discuss or say such things so that is what he says about um, holidays and then he talks about there is a reference to the mighty Bodley. Bodley is a library at Oxford. Okay, Oxford University. There are many colleges, many separate colleges, which all together comprises this Oxford University. And so this Bodley is a library in one of these colleges. Now, in the next um, paragraph, he tells us how on these holidays, his main pastime was to visit this Oxford that is how you get the title of this essay Oxford in the vacation so he says that I used to get holidays as a clerk I used to get holidays on the same days that the students also used to get holidays because it's public holidays for all and so when uh, he used to go to the uh, campus of the college and just stroll around there and uh, and there would be nobody there to disturb him or question him so uh, he to such a one as myself who has been defrauded in his young years of the sweet food of academic institution so he was defrauded because uh, he could not taste the sweet food of academic institutions because as mentioned earlier he had to start working when he was 15 years old and so he finds a uh, lot of pleasure in going and spending time in a campus uh, so their vacation too uh, at this time of the year falls in so packed with ours ours the clerks and theirs the students and so he goes there and he takes walks unmolested nobody would stop him nobody would ask him where you're going and all those things and he would just walk and he says he used to play all kind of he used to pretend all kind of uh, pretend to be sometimes he would pretend to be the student that's why he says here i can hear play the gentleman enact the student so sometimes he would pretend that he is a uh, a new student and then sometimes he would uh, think when the chapel bells ring he, he would he would imagine that the bell is ringing for him because when the bell rings the students have to go to the chapel so he who would imagine that the bell is ringing for him and sometimes when he is in a very humble mood he would act as a caesar Caesar is a student who uh, studied on scholarship, the poor students who were given scholarships to study. So when I'm in a very humble mood, I would pretend to be a Caesar or a servitor. A servitor is some kind of a doing some kind of a small job there. And sometimes when the peacock vein rises, see how he says that peacock vein rises. Peacock vein is, you know, proud as a peacock. A peacock is supposed to be a proud bird. And so when the peacock vein rises, when he, when he feels very proud of himself, I struck a gentleman commoner. So a gentleman commoner is a, a undergraduate student, okay, a, a level higher. And so um, a gentleman commoner, and when he feels more graver and more serious, he uh, pretends to be a master of arts. He's going to, he pretends that he's a PG student. And uh, so he says, and uh, fortunately, I even looked like one. And he says that he always used to wear black a coat, black dress. And so that made it easier to look like a student or a scholar. And he says that when he walks through the university campus, sometimes, uh, and even otherwise, he says in the church, when he goes to the church, the verger, verger is a you know, man who assists the priest in the church. Inside the church, he's got some duties. That is the verger. And a dim-eyed verger, a verger maybe with poor eyesight, would wish him, would bow to him because he was dressed in black and he looks quite elegant and so um, 
they mistake him for a gentleman and uh, so he tries all that in the campus and he feels very and he says sometimes people even think i am a seraphic doctor i guess doctor here means a, a phd holder a scholar of great distinct uh, distinction and so uh, that is how he used to enjoy his holidays and in the next paragraph he talks about again about the walks in the among the tall trees of the Christ's College or the groves of Magdalen College and uh, the ho- there's nobody there okay the halls are deserted open windows inviting one to slip in unperceived and uh, he looks at the pictures of some founder you know that in all these places the photographs of paintings of um, the benefactors of that place would be kept and so he looks at all of them they might be a lady who is a royal benefactress of that college so all these people look down at him with a kind of a benevolence he looks up at them with a lot of reverence and then he goes and takes a peep in in, in the butteries and sculleries so buttery again is the place where um, uh, all the food items of the wine and a cake and of course butter and all these things are stored that is the buttery and the sculleries are places where adjoining the kitchen you have places where the utensils are washed where you have water supply and such things sculleries then kitchen fireplaces so he walks through all these places and he imagines uh, the kind of uh, activity that must be going on in these places when it is a working day and he thinks oh my god this is the kitchen where once upon a time somebody must have cooked food for people like chaucer because chaucer was a student of oxford university and so when he thinks that way he feels so overwhelmed and he feels so respectful of the whole thing and he says that even the minor servants there to he, in his mind they all assume respectable positions because they were all people who had seen great men alive and cooked for them and washed for them so here you can see his his ardent uh, fervor for this college and how he missed being in college so all that you can see in this paragraph in the next paragraph he uh, this is a very popular paragraph maybe you would get it for annotations in your exams or um, it, this is often quoted to so he is addressing it he's talking to antiquity antiquity you know is um, ancientness the past the glorious past and he says antiquity the wondrous charm what art thou that being nothing art everything when the word the word not antiquity then the word nothing but hadst a remoter antiquity if you read it it's a quite a interesting uh, paragraph but i'm not reading it now so he is uh, dwelling upon this idea of ancientness and the past he says what charm the past has and charles lamb specially was very very nostalgic we can say that he dwelt in the past so he says how charming you are and actually what are you the past and antiquity what are you he asks because when you were you were nothing and now after many years you were something but then you were nothing so as thou called it would look back with blind veneration it's so like what he's telling us is see when we live in a certain period now for example we don't realize that this is something very important now for instant let me just relate it to the current day and tell you like now we are living in an in in an age of this corona or covid-19 and of course this has affected us uh, and for a f- the initial few days we had real trouble adjusting with this um, this new uh, thing that came into our life this virus and all the ensuing confusion and the disease and we were all very careful we are still very careful of course that is how we should be but now we have almost taken this for granted we have come to terms with what is happening around us so we all have we have made it a habit to wear a mask to wash our hands to use sanitizers <coughs> to maintain social distancing and all those things but later on maybe after a hundred years when somebody looks back at this age they would say that just like we read you know about the plague the black death that happened in 1318 in britain and all that so we would be thinking oh my god what a horrible time that was how the people must have suffered that is exactly how people would look at us after a few years a 50 or 100 years later that is how they will speak about us oh that was a horrible time the people couldn't go out of their houses the world would look at us 
or at this particular period after a long time and they would say that in the books you would read about this particular age that it was a horrible times to be alive and the people were suffering they couldn't go out of their homes they were quarantined and uh, they always had to wear masks which uh, and they could never reveal their faces they couldn't have any kind of celebration so it was a dark period in human history that is how it would be mentioned but now we have come to terms with the whole thing so that is exactly what he is telling about. So what art thou? When thou wert, thou were not antiquity. Then thou wert nothing. And those days, something older would be considered antiquity. So that is what he says. And what mystery lacks in this extroversion? Or what half Janesis are we that cannot look forward with the same idolatry which, with which we for ever revert so he says we are half janus now janus is a, a greek or i think it's a roman uh, a god who had two heads one head looking forward and the other head is at the back looking that side so it is from janus we get the word january because january is the beginning of a new year it looks forward towards february march april and so on at the same time the other head looks at december uh, november october that way too so that is janus and he says that we are half janus because human beings always have this tendency to keep looking at the past that's why we are half more than the future we uh, at least some of us or most of us i should say we prefer to think about the past and you you feel unhappy about what happened in the past or you feel happy about what happened in the past and you fail to deal with the present that is what he is talking about here what half janus are we that cannot look forward to the same idolatry. Idolatry here is worship or interest or whatever. And um, the mighty future is as nothing being everything. The past is everything being nothing. He says the future is what actually matters. But then we behave as though the future is nothing. And the past actually doesn't matter at all because it's the past. But we give a lot of importance to the past. Now this reminds me of a, a very famous line from Shelley's to a skylark where Shelley says we look before and after and pine for what is not you've come across that line I hope we look before and after and pine for what is not so he compares there Shelley is making a comparison between the bird skylark and human beings he wonders how this bird can sing so beautifully what joy must be the source of this kind of uh, music and then that is where he says that human beings always have this problem we keep looking worrying about the past or maybe the future too but we are never bothered concerned about the present and the bird doesn't have that issue that is why the bird is so happy that is the conclusion that um, Shelley comes to so this um, these are all contemporaries you know so there are many uh, uh, thoughts that are very similar and this is what um, I mean this is an idea that many many writers of all ages have mentioned and then he gives a very interesting observation about the dark ages and actually when I read it yesterday I, I laughed out loud loud because you know i react very spontaneously to what i read and write sometimes i cry sometimes i laugh but then this one made me laugh yesterday because he says what were the dark ages surely the sun rose as brightly then as now and man got him so uh, what he says here is that we have all heard about the dark ages and what is the picture that comes to your mind when you say dark ages so he says we kind of think that the dark ages were a time when everything was dark and uh, you couldn't see people's faces properly and that and our ancestors or people who lived during those dark ages they couldn't see anything and they were groping in the dark that is the kind of a feeling we have about the dark ages but he says but definitely that was not true those days too in the morning the sun would have risen and the people would have got up gone uh, attended their jobs or whatever so he says this is all it's it's all the the perception that differs after a long time when somebody says the dark ages we who don't know what it was have this idea a very romantic kind of an illusion about the antiquity so that is how human beings react to antiquity they have a very a fanciful idea of the whole thing
so how beautifully he says that so he goes on so all this these these are all digressions you see this is what i meant when i said that he digresses from the main topic he is actually talking to us about his visit to the oxford and walking around there in the vacation but see so many things he told us about the holidays he took us uh, through a list of saints and he told us about what he felt about holidays and now he says that uh, he says all this about antiquity so that's why his essays are long and rambling they go on and on and he takes us through various paths 